Welcome to the third presentation on the business plan. This part is about the financial assessment. My name is Jeroen Pruin and I'm an assistant professor at Delft University. So what to do? Let's assume you have an oil tanker which is worth 25 million, 15 years old and you have a potential for a five year contract of refreshment. On the other hand, you have a dry bill carrier worth 15 million, 10 years old, but it doesn't have a contract yet. Which of these two ships would you invest in? Which one to buy? Why would you invest in this one? Which one has the better perspectives? Well, this is what we're gonna answer in this presentation. So the objective is how to judge two different investment options fairly. The expected prior knowledge for this, presenta for this presentation is that you are aware of the creation of an income assessment from a market analysis, which is of course explained in the previous presentation. The trip call calculation for a voyage charter, which is explained in a separate presentation, also in this YouTube channel, and the contract types and their relations to vessel costs, which is also explained in the trip calculation presentation. And finally, the scrap value and depreciation and how this works should also be known to you. Then for the content, in this presentation, we're going to solve the issue presented of choosing, a choosing between two different investments by establishing a free cash flow, calculating the IRR, determining the financing cost for the company, and then finally comparing them using the MPV as well. What IRR and MPV means, I will address in this presentation. So first, establish a free cash flow. For any investment, the free cash flow has a certain, well, continuous to it, a certain, it, it is similar for most uh, cash flows. You buy the ship or something else, you trade it, you use it for the first year, the second year, a couple of year more, and then the final year. And after that final year of using it, you sell it. So these, all these elements need to be determined to establish the free cash flow. So if we look at the investment side, there is buying the ship and selling the ship. If we take back the tanker from the example, then buying the ship is 25 million, uh, that's a cash out, and selling the ship in this case will be cash in. Even the ship that is going for scrap will still give you some money. In other situations, this might not be the case, but with ships, you can always count on getting some money back from your initial investment. Well, in this case, we looked it up, and basically you can look at the book value. So we know that when the ship is at the end of its 25th year, so 26 years old, the value of the ship will be, to, uh, will be only 3 million left. Then over time, the, the remaining 10 years, every year 2 million will be written off of the, of the ship's value. Uh, and this way you can calculate the ship's value at any moment in time. Of course, this is a very, well, uh, optimistic or, or at least um, limited view on the selling of a ship because over time markets might change and you might, might get more money for it, you might get less money for it. But this is usually done because you don't know what is gonna happen. So then rather go for a simple approach than something complex where you are guessing or estimating a lot more variables. But in the end, you're also increasing the uncertainty. Then for the trading, of course, trading, I have yearly income that I need to determine and I have yearly expenses. Well, the yearly income in this case, of course, we have for the tanker, we have the five year contract of refreshment, which for which I know what kind of income I will have. I will uh, afterwards discuss uh, what will happen if you don't know exactly what you have and what you can do to remedy this. And then for the yearly expenses, I have my operational expenses or OPEX which are the costs that I have for the vessel, no matter what. So crew, uh, crew wages, uh, maintenance, uh, other things like insurance, administration costs, classification costs, all these things are part of the OPEX. Because no matter if I sail with the vessel or if I have it laying in, in, the, in the harbor, all these costs will continue to, uh, to go on. Furthermore, I have the voyage expenses or voyage. And these costs I only have when I actively use the vessel. So these include port fees, kennel fees, and stuff like that. And OPEX, if, if I know what kind of vessel I want to buy, then OPEX is usually 
easy to, to remedy. Uh, you are already familiar with these ships, or you can buy consultant reports or overviews where you can see what kind of regular costs you can expect for such a vessel. So what remains is the five-year contract of abatement is income, how to deal with that, and the voyage. So if we look at the income from voyages, and the net income from voyages we're talking about here, what is your trip cycle? Uh, in the case of this five-year contract of abatement, I might go with my oil tanker, I might go from the Middle East to uh, Western Europe, and then empty back to the Middle East and continue that cycle. So this is a full trip cycle, and I need to continue this uh, from start point to start point cycle to have a good assessment of the cost. Other options, if I would uh, take the broker that we had in the beginning, for example, that might be loading in the Gulf of Mexico for Europe, then in Europe it loads something for the area of New York, and then it goes empty along the coast to the Gulf again to pick up a new cargo there. So in this case, you get a triangle where two parts are loaded and one part is unloaded. Many more complex forms can of course be imagined, but in general, this is a, this is, these two options are the most common. Two, two loaded parts with a small uh, ballast part in between for the tram shipping, and for the long-term shipping contracts, you usually have a, full, a loaded part and an empty part back. So for such a triangle or such a, a, a back and forward and vice versa route, I can calculate the total income. And using the average weight and the average utilization of my ship, so how much weight and how much cargo uh, there is, I can calculate what my income will be. Also, I can determine the duration. And the duration I need to know, because otherwise I don't know how much income I will have during the year. So with the duration, I, I need the average speed, the average distance that I need to travel, especially for the triangle route, and I, I need to add that. And maybe there are some different triangles where you can take an average from. Uh, you need to include the time lost waiting for the bird, or also waiting for a new cargo, and the time lost that you have loading and unloading, where you are not moving. So this will give you a total cycle duration and a total cycle income. Next, looking at the same trip cycles, what are my voyage expenses? Well, first of all, as I mentioned before, there's the port fees, and port fees are for all ports in the cycle, also the ones that enter empty. And then, especially if you look, for example, for the uh, Middle East to Europe route, you will go to the Suez Canal, so you need to take into account the canal fees. And also, as I explained before, with the waiting, also waiting in front of a canal should, of course, be added to that. And finally, there is the fuel consumption. How much fuel do I use? Well, that depends, again, on the speed. So both the, uh, the cycle time, but also the fuel consumption, and especially the cost of the fuel consumption, are both dependent on the speed you pick for each of the legs that you are doing. And this, uh, this, is, a, this is an influence, it is a mutual influence, where you can slightly optimize uh, the situation. The optimization of that is part of another uh, video lecture on this YouTube channel, and I will not discuss it here. But do realize that they are linked, and that is why you always take the income and the voyage expenses together without taking into account the OPEX at this point. So your yearly net trade income is your income minus your voyage expenses divided by the duration. And then, of course, multiplied by the days per year. So this is your total income in a year that you will be obtaining from the different voyages that you are planned or the average voyages that you have planned. Of course, this is a rough estimation and many things can go wrong. You might have, you might miss a cycle, there might be uh, changes in, in, in the tariffs, etc. But this is the first average uh, that you can calculate and should be enough for a first calculation. What to do with all these uncertainties, I will discuss at the end of this presentation. Is this cash flow enough? Well, that depends. Uh, and there's two ways of looking at if it's enough. Uh, uh, if we can calculate this cash flow, we need to know, is it enough to do the investment? Well, I have payback time and discounted cash flow, and I've both put them in a graph for this particular example of the, uh, of the tanker. So you see we start at minus 25, and in this case, we gain a moderate amount of money, especially in the payback time, each year there will be an increase in the money, and by the end, I have made 20 million, or almost 20 million. However, if I look at the discounted cash flow, it's a lot less. So, which one would I need to take, and, and what is discounted cash flow? Well, 
discounted cash flow is basically taking into consideration the fact that money earned in the future is worth less if you would express it in money earned today. And to give you an example of that, consider for yourself, uh, if I would give you 100 euros now or 100 euros next year, which one would you prefer? Well, in this case, most of you or probably 100% of you will prefer the 100 euros now. However, this will change slightly when you say that I'm giving you 95 euros now or 100 euros next year. Some of you will find me trustworthy enough and say, well, I'd rather have the 100 next year. And some of you will say, no, I'd rather have the 95 right now. Well, the same goes 90. More and more people will be inclined to take the, the 100 next year. 85, more, even more people are inclined to take the next year, et cetera. So this way, uh, which, whenever you switch from the getting the money now to the money next year, that is roughly what is your discount rate for the future money. So in one year's time, you believe that the money you get now is worth more than uh, 100 euros a year later. To put this in further perspective, you can actually calculate this rate uh, by dividing the money next year by the money now. And you can see that in my case, for example, around 90% or around 90, around 11%, I would switch to the 100 euros next year because I don't believe I can make 90 euros into 100 next year, or especially not 85. So the accepted ratio, as I mentioned, is your time value of money. And this is different for everybody. Uh, there, there's some personal belief in there. It is even different for every situation. How much do you trust the person offering you the money? How, how reliable is that source? <clears throat> and the more reliable, the, the more you're willing to, uh, to, to take this gamble with. So, and then the IRR is a special case. The, I, the IRR, or the internal rate of return, is the rate at which the project discounted cash flow will amount to exactly zero. So what you do here is you take the formula that I showed you uh, before, where you say the discounted cash flow is the sum of all cash flows divided by the discount rate. And you say that the discount rate, you replace that by the IRR, and you say the sum has to be zero. So the free cash flow, you know, and yeah, the, the number of years you're gonna take into account, you know, and zero, you know. So the only thing that you don't know is the IRR, which means that you can solve this equation by solving, uh, by, by changing the IRR just until the, the total sum is zero. <clears throat> when you do this, there's two things to take into account. So the IRR needs to be above 0%. Of course, because if it's below 0%, you're losing money, and the time value of money is negative. In extremely rare cases, this might be acceptable, uh, but in general, you want it to be positive. And your IRR should be compared to your company's discounted cash flow rate. Uh, as I just showed in the previous slide, each one of us, given a certain situation, might have a different uh, discounted cash flow rate. And this is also true for your company. So <clears throat> if you take the company's discounted cash flow, then you should be able to uh, discount cash flow rate, sorry, then you should be able to compare it to the IRR. So in this example, uh, we've looked at the tanker, and the tanker was 25 million. I'm assuming that I will have it for a period of 10 years. And the reason for that is that I believe that after the first five-year contract with this client, I am able to convince them to give me another five-year contract. <clears throat> the value at the end, based on the, de on the depreciation, is the book value, which is 5 million. And the net income I have calculated based on this back and forth trip and the five year contract that I'm supposed to get is 6 million. This is already deducted, uh, the, the voyage expenses are already deducted for it, and the speed required for the contract, etc., is taken into, into account. Finally, my OPEX I estimate to be 2 million. So now I have all the elements I need to calculate my free cash flow. As I started this presentation with, uh, the free cash flow has the three elements. So there's the investment at the start, which is minus 25, as you can see. Then there is the free cash flow for each year, which is the net trade income minus the OPEX, which is 4 million and 6 minus 2 for year 1 to year 10. And at the end of year 10, I will sell the vessel. So I will get the value at the end back, which is 5 million in cash back. If I put this in the formula, uh, I, I split out the sum now in different uh, values and in the series, 
you can see that in the first year, that is year zero when I buy the vessel, uh, it's minus 25 and then there's 4 million. And the last year there's 4 million plus the 5 million that I get at the end. And this needs to be zero. So if I calculate it using, for example, an Excel solver, I will get the IRR is 11.28%. Sounds good. <clears throat> but is it good enough? How will I finance the selected ship? And, and this is influencing uh, your choices. Within the maritime business game, you are a new company, so you don't have any finances, and you can look at the finances of this vessel directly. Which means you can look at the equity that you are willing to invest, the senior debt you're able to get on the vessel, and perhaps even a junior debt or some assumptions of junior debt. In my case, I assume that I will invest seven and a half millions. Then I take a 15 million in a senior debt, which is about 60% of the vessel value, which is a reasonable amount. And then I have a junior debt of two and a half percent, which I have with my, well, bunker suppliers or other contractors where I'm not paying any interest. And this is not always the case, but in my case, I, I believe that I'm able to pull that up. So if I take these values and multiply them by the percentage of each of the different rates, so 15% for my own equity, because it's a high risk business, 5% on the loan, which is an average loan rate, and then 0% for the final one. And I multiply the amount by the percentage every time, and then I divide it by the total amount. And this way I get the average percentage, which is the WEC, the weighted effort cost of capital, which in my case would be 7.5%. If I would be an existing company, and this is just a, a fake balance sheet that I found on the internet to give you an idea, then I have to look at the right side of my company. Here I have my liabilities and shareholders equity. And I can use these in the same way that I've used here the, the web calculation based on, on my initial investment. And if I'm a company, I have the current liabilities, which is account payables, uh, accrued expenses, deferred revenue. And all these elements you see here, none of them are short-term loan. They are short-term loans, but another short-term loan with a bank with a direct uh, impact on them. So that means that all these elements I can borrow against 0%. Then there's the long-term debt, which is 200,000 on this balance sheet. And then there's the equity, which is another uh, slightly more than 200,000, the sum of the shareholders' equity. And those want to have some form of dividend, some form of return on their, on their equity. And that might be 10%, it might be 15%, 12% or something in that area. So also using the balance sheet, I can, if for an existing company, I can calculate my weighted effort cost of capital independent of the current investment. Of course, I need to increase my balance with the current investment to get to the right number. But if you're a big company, that would not really matter. But then if I take the other ship, which was the docker that I presented at the beginning, that ship costs only 15 million. I'm assuming it will be seven years because the trade that I want to exploit is uh, looking for not too old vessels. So with 17 years, I think my vessel will be too old. At the end of that seven year period, I, I, my book value of the vessel will be 10 million. And the net trade income I estimated to be 4 million. Of course, I don't have a contract here, but I've looked at the contracts in the market. And also, of course, at the, the trade flows within the market and determined that with the right triangle, I would be able to get 4 million a year. The OPEX I looked up as well, which were 1.5 million for the ship. Well, same as the last example on the left side, you can see that of course the free cash flow in the year zero is minus 15, which is the purchase price. Then for year one to 10, I get my trade income, which is the 4 million net trade income minus the OPEX, which is another 2.5 million every year. And then in the final year, I'm getting 10 million back. We can make the same calculation, only this one is a bit shorter because it only goes to seven, because I only have seven years. And if I calculate the IRR in this case, then the IRR is 13.51%. Oh, that is higher than the 11.28% that I had for the tanker. I might assume that it's a good idea to buy this bulker. Uh, in both cases, the important things to notice are that the IRR is above zero, and the IRR is above the WAC that we calculated, which was 7.5%. So both options are viable. So if I could do both, if I would have the money for both, I could also decide to do both. But if I would have to pick between these two, well, maybe the IRR is a good idea. 
Well, it is and it isn't. The IR is very sensitive to, for example, the period. And of course, in that present, the, 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 the discounted pressure is, is sensitive to a period in any case. But the IRR does not tell you exactly how much you earn. Maybe because this investment is lower, uh, the IRR is higher and I might not end up with as much money as I could have with doing the other. So instead of the IRR, you should be looking at the net present value, which will tell you how much in today's cash a certain investment will generate. So using the discounted cash flow, you're, you're estimating the, to the, the total cash flow generated by that investment using the company's discount rate or the weighted effort cost of capital. <clears throat> so the formula changes slightly again. It's still largely the same formula. But in this case, I take, uh, I take the WEC instead of the IRR. And the WEC I know, the free cash flow I know. And so I only calculate the left side, so my total discounted cash flow, which I call the net present value, NPV. And like with the WEC, the NPV should be larger than zero. And actually the NPV will be zero if your WEC is equal to your IRR. So, so there is where the two equations become the same. So comparing the net present value, well, You've seen the calculations before, so I'm just going to present you the net present value calculation for the tanker. And again, minus 25, 1 plus 7.5% to the power of 0, 1, etc. for each of the consecutive years. And in year 10, I will get the resale value back. If I calculate this, uh, I used Excel in this case, I get 4.88 million. For the bulker, I get the same, I fill in the same numbers as before for the IRR calculation. Instead so of the IRR and the zero, I now calculate with 7.5% and I get 4.27 million. Looking at the net present value, the tanker seems to be better than the bulker. So let's compare them side by side. Then we have a purchase price of 25 million and I'm assuming that I can pay that. We have a purchase price of 15 million. The period is 10 years and seven years. There's some differences there. The value at the end is of course greatly different and also the income and the OPEX are different. But then if we come to the interesting part, the IRR and the net present value, then we see that there's 11.28% for the tanker and 13.51% for the bulker. And in the net present value, the, prefer the preference is reversed where the tanker earns us 4.88 million and the bulker is slightly behind with 4.27 million. So based on this data alone, I would advise to go for the tanker because the tanker is earning you more money. Of course, if besides the bulker, you can find another project of 10 million, which will earn you the, more than the difference between the tanker and the bulker, you could also invest in these two projects and get a higher net present value in total, and then they would be a better option. <clears throat> but overall, you will take the net present value over the IRR as a measure of which investment to take. However, if we look at this data, uh, as I said in the beginning, you do, do, you do take some assumptions. You do make some assumptions where uh, that might influence the results. So instead of looking at only the values that are just presented and saying, well, we're going to take the tanker, you should consider that, uh, for example, a higher investment will lower your net present value. But also higher income will lead to a higher net present value. These two are quite logical. More idle time in your calculation, so in your duration calculation, will actually lower your net present value. Of course, your income, your yearly income will be lower. A higher weighted average cost of capital will again lower your net present value. And there might be a point where the net present value is lowered further. Uh, and there might be a tipping point in this case, for example, where if it would be 8% for the WEC, that the broker might be the better option for the net present value and not the tanker. So you need to do a uh, longer duration, same thing. So you need to do some sensitivity analysis on all the elements you're not sure about. How far can they change before the other investment is becoming the best option? And this means also that of course, there, there is some subjectivity in these calculations and you cannot remove it. So just be aware that and that present value or all the, calc or the IRR calculations, there's not, they're not the holy grail. They, they will not prevent you from making mistakes because there is some subjectivity to it. But, they will prevent you from making the worst mistakes. Because even if you include your subjectivity, you are coming at a negative net present value or 
an IRR that is below your WEC, then you know that it's never a good idea to do this investment. So use, it, use these tools wisely, be aware of the subjectivity, and, but do, do use them to make the choices you need to take. So in summary, calculate the free cash flow uh, using the trip cycles, determine if the IRR is above 0%, determine the WEC for your investment or your company, and compare the IRR, of course, also to the WEC. If it's larger than that and you still have more than one investment available, then create the net present value calculation and compare these to pick the one with the highest net present value. And finally, before you pick one, play with these values for robustness and be aware of the impact of each element on the final values and how this uncertainty might affect the, the actual profit you are gaining with. This was my presentation and I thank you for your attention.